Welcome to this sermon from Silver Lake Baptist Church. Our mission is to celebrate the greatness of God with all we are for the joy, hope, and renewal of our community. We are so glad you have chosen to listen to our message. We pray you will be blessed by your time with us today. Has anybody ever been lost enough that it actually mattered? Like you got lost and it made you late for something that you shouldn't have been late for, or you ended up somewhere you didn't want to be? Anybody have something like that? Some of you know, uh, when I was in high school, the last couple of years of high school here in Washington, I worked at McDonald's, and I was a shift manager, and one of the responsibilities of a shift manager when you come on was to make sure that we had all the supplies to keep McDonald's happy. And you may not think about that when you go to get your cheeseburger or fries or milkshake, whatever, but they run out of stuff periodically. And so one day I went to McDonald's and they were out of the shake mix to put in the milkshake machine. That is a crisis, right? We can't have a McDonald's without milkshakes. So I called around to the other local stores to say, who has extra shake mix? What can I trade you? That kind of thing. But the only place I could find was in North Seattle. And I hadn't had a driver's license very long. And there, there was not ubiquitous GPS. And even if there were, I wouldn't have had it because it would have cost money. And I worked at McDonald's. And I couldn't afford GPS. So I headed down to North Seattle to find this McDonald's that I had never been to. And I got lost. And I came near the Woodland Park Zoo. This intersection still exists. There's a five-way intersection on which two of them are one-ways, and the other one you can turn on to either of the other one-ways. And I came to this intersection, and I was like, I do not even know what the rules are at an intersection that looks like this. What am I supposed to do? I ended up going the wrong way on a one-way street in Seattle looking for shake mix in my McDonald's uniform. And that's the kind of thing that we don't want in our lives, right? We don't like that feeling of being lost, of going to the wrong place, of breaking rules that could result in someone crashing into me at a high rate of speed. Everything was bad about it. And this morning in the message, we're going to see some of the risks associated with being just a little bit off course. And I have an illustration to prepare us for that that has to do with aviation. Who's traveled on a commercial jet plane before? Most of us, I think, a lot of us, yeah. And when you do that, you normally fly between about 28,000 and about 41,000 feet. But the most fun part for me is actually when you're either taking off or landing and you're closer to the ground. Because you can see everything, and it looks so cool to see everything. And I've often thought about how much cooler it would be if they just flew us along at like 1,000 feet, right? So I could check out everything for the whole flight. But no one ever does that for me for some reason. I've even dreamt about it, right? I've had dreams about what if I just flew really low over all this stuff. But back in the day, there was the opportunity to do this. Uh, there was actually a company, uh, New Zealand Air, that did tours of Antarctica flying at low altitude in a commercial jetliner. And I actually have a picture of one of the planes that did it. So look at that. You're in a real plane, and they fly you around Antarctica at relatively low elevation, so you can check everything out, you know, see, see the ice and everything that's down there. And so this happened on November 28th. And this is the actual plane involved in the story that I'm going to tell this morning. November 28th of 1979, it was Air New Zealand Flight 901. And so this plane takes off from New Zealand, and they're flying down to Antarctica to show everybody all the cool stuff in Antarctica. One minor detail that I haven't mentioned yet. At about 1.30 on the morning before they took off, a minor change was made to the navigational system on the plane that adjusted one of their waypoints two degrees. Okay, so just a two degree change in their course. So they're heading off to Antarctica. Everybody's happy, they have their video cameras running and people are taking pictures out the windows and they're looking at all kinds of cool stuff. And at one point, uh, can we bring up the next picture? There's a map of where they went. So they were going to go into a sound over here to, to look at um, a bay with ice coming into the bay. It was really beautiful and all that sort of thing. But this is where they were two degrees off their course. And they, were, they descended to about 1,500 feet, which is really low based on what I just told you, right? They're 20,000 feet and more below where they would normally be flying. So they could get a, a good look at, at what they saw. And Aaron, can we bring up the next picture? In order for the rest of the story to make sense, we need to talk about something uh, this is called a sector whiteout. This is what the pilots experienced for this story to happen. And basically, you know when light hits a white surface, what happens? It reflects off the surface, right? So something can happen when you're in a mixed cloudy sky and you have a white surface on the ground, like say for instance a snow-covered mountain, and white clouds above, the light just reflects back and forth on the white surfaces and pretty soon your brain's like, you know what, I can't handle this. There's just white stuff in front of you, trust me. And so what you see is white. And that's what these pilots saw. And they flew into the side of a mountain at 450 miles per hour. 
there were 257 folks on the plane, and all of them died because they were two degrees off course. And you think that's so insignificant. Two degrees, if I turn that much, you couldn't even really tell. Two degrees is a tiny adjustment, but it resulted in the loss of lives of 257 individuals. And that's amazing. And we see in the Bible, you know what? In the rest of our lives, the same kind of risk exists. Just tweaking the story a little bit, just being a little bit off course in our understanding of who God is and what he's done for us can result in tragic consequences. And let's look at how that works out. If you have a Bible with you, turn it to 1 Corinthians 15. And we're going to begin in verse 29 this morning. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 29. And as we're heading there, I'll pray for us. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege we have of being here this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you that you put us on a solid path with a firm foundation. And Lord, I ask that you'd help us to rest in your path, to trust in your plan, and not to make deviations, not to try to map our own course or to change from where you've given us guidance, but to trust you and to obey you and to honor the plan for our lives that you've established. Lord, we rely on you because we are so easily distracted. We are so easily pulled into the temptations of this world, to our own cares and concerns, and we depend on your spirit working inside of us to change our desires, to change our behaviors, to put us on a path that leads to health, to wholeness, to a right relationship with you. We thank you that all those things are possible for us because of what Jesus did on the cross in our place. We love you and thank you for these gifts. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, 1 Corinthians 15, 29 says, Otherwise, what will they do who are baptized for the dead if the dead do not rise at all? Why then are they baptized for the dead? And hopefully when you read that verse, you're made aware of a need to back up a little bit, just like last week, right? Otherwise, what otherwise? So let's take a look. Remember, as we wrapped up last week, we were talking about the fact that God had put everything under the authority of Christ and the last enemy, enemy to be defeated is death. So death, defeat has been announced as of last week. And he's saying, if that's not true, if there's no resurrection from the dead, if Jesus hasn't risen, then why are these people getting baptized for the dead? What's the point of getting baptized for dead people if the dead never rise? Why are they then baptized for the dead? And there are two kind of schools of thought on what this verse means. The first is kind of the plain reading obvious one, that there was some sect of people at Corinth, the same place that had the people saying that there was no resurrection of the dead, may have also had a group of people who were practicing proxy baptism. Has anyone heard the term proxy baptism before? There's still a cult that practices it. The Mormons do this. And, and maybe you've even been invited at some point. So... They go to the temple, and they have lists of folks who have passed away who were not Mormons, and they will be baptized. And so that's like a youth group activity that they do sometimes. They can go and be baptized for multiple people over the course of a day in proxy for the person who's dead. So because this person failed to get baptized during their time on earth, and, and we want them to be in good standing with God, we'll go get baptized for them. Hopefully it's apparent to everybody that doesn't really match up with the plan we have in the Bible, but that's what people do even now. And there's some belief that that's what was happening at Corinth. The other possibility is that this is uh, a, a slight translation thing, and it should say baptized over the dead instead of baptized for the dead. And what that would mean is talking about people who are getting baptized right before death, which definitely was a thing that was taking place back then and happens now. You may know of someone who did that because they were concerned about their standing before God and they didn't want to die without doing everything God wanted them to do, so they were baptized in the last few days of their life on earth. In either case, the same principle clearly applies. Paul's asking them, if you don't think there's a resurrection from the dead, why are you doing things that only matter after you're dead? Right? So we could go to the Mormon and say, why are you getting baptized for that guy? If once you're dead, you're dead, and that's the end of the story. There's no value in you wasting your time getting baptized for this person. Or if it's someone who's not sure of their faith, and they're getting baptized in the last few minutes before death, or the last few days before death, what's the point? Why don't you just make yourself comfortable and, and wait and die and not worry about this whole baptism thing? And so this is a question that I think a lot of us wrestle with, but in a totally different sphere. And this is how I phrased it. 
why make investments in the afterlife if there is no afterlife? And that's the first question in your notes this morning. Why make investments in the afterlife if there is no afterlife? And I think every single one of us has wrestled with this question on at least some level, right? Why am I doing these things that are really for the next life? Why don't I just put all my attention, attention and focus and energy into this life that I know I have, right? I'm here right now. I can see my hands. I know that I'm alive. And I can see the benefits and consequences that my actions now have on the earth. So why not just put all my attention, all my focus into this life? And we've wrestled with that even as believers, right? There's enough doubt back there that Jesus is really going to come back or that there's really going to be a heaven or that I'm really going to live forever that sometimes it affects my thinking. Sometimes maybe I, I don't invest as fully in the kingdom because I'm too wrapped up in what's going on in this life. And so this is a question that stems from the broader question Paul's wrestling with in all of 1 Corinthians 15. If... Jesus didn't really rise from the dead. If I'm not really going to rise from the dead, why would I make an investment in the next life? Why would I invest in what's to come? And so we see that just adjusting the course a little, right? These guys can believe everything of Christianity. They can believe the whole gospel except the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And do you see what a difference it makes in how they live their lives? I'm not going to invest in God's kingdom if this is all there is. That doesn't make sense. And that's just in verse 29. We see more questions that pop up in the next few verses. Verse 30 says, And why do we stand in jeopardy every hour? What does he mean by that question? Who's standing in jeopardy? I'm quite certain this doesn't involve Alex Trebek. He's talking about these folks who were risking their lives, himself included. Right? The early Christians were risking their lives in order to take a stand, to say, yes, I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe that he died for my sins, and I believe that he rose again. And he's saying, if Jesus didn't rise again, why would I risk my life? Why are you guys risking your lives to hold these church services if Jesus didn't even rise from the dead, if you're not going to rise from the dead? The next part of the verse says, I affirm by the boasting in you, which I have in Christ Jesus the Lord, I die daily. Okay, and so there's two things that I think we should clarify a little bit there. The first is this boasting that he has in them in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? What boast might Paul have in the folks at Corinth in Christ Jesus? So the first thing to be clear about is whenever he boasts, he's only going to boast in Jesus. Remember, he made that clear already. Whatever things he has to be proud of, excited about, it's the work that Christ has done in him. And so he's saying there's something great that Christ has done in Paul related to the people at Corinth. What might that be? Their faith. He came as a missionary to them, and now there's a church big enough to send him letters full of questions and full of all kinds of disciplinary problems that he has to write them back about to help correct them. And we see the same thing in his letter in 1 Thessalonians. He writes, For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? So what is Paul excited about? He's excited about Gentile people People who had no hope in God, no connection to God's people, standing before Jesus at his coming and being kids of the king, heirs of the kingdom. How did that happen? Somebody came to them and shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with people who didn't deserve it. And Paul's saying, that's what God used me to do. God used me to share the gospel with you. And so I'm excited about the day he returns and we're going to stand there together celebrating who Jesus is and the new home that he's prepared for us in heaven. So what does he have to boast about? He has these people. He's celebrating the work that Jesus did to bring them into a right relationship with himself. And the last part is the second portion I think we need to clarify. He says, I die daily. Did Paul die every day? Probably not. <laughs> No, he, he's exposed to the threat of death, the risk of death every day. And we read about that a couple weeks ago, right? Paul was constantly under some kind of threat. And we'll look at that section again in just a few minutes. But Paul was saying he already considered his life forfeit to the kingdom. And why would I do that? Why would I submit my life to such risk if Jesus didn't really rise from the dead? If he didn't demonstrate for me that I have the hope of eternal life in him. And he clarifies that in verse 32. If, in the manner of men, 
I have fought with beasts at Ephesus. What advantage is it to me? If the dead do not rise, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Who's heard the saying, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die, or something similar? Who knows where it came from? So it sounds like something from some pagan culture that's just celebrating, hey, we're going to die anyways, so let's have a party, right? And Paul did quote from pagan cultures a couple times, but this isn't one of those. If you flip back in the Old Testament to Isaiah 22, that's what he's quoting from. Isaiah 22, we find the judgment of God being announced and the reaction of the people not being what God wanted, right? So the infrastructure is crumbling around them, houses are being destroyed, and God says to these people, look, you, you counted up the number of houses remaining, you used the rubble to try to reestablish your walls, you stockpiled water from the fountain because you recognized you were under siege and bad things were happening, but you didn't remember the God who made the foundations. And so the judgment is, you guys are doing everything you can to protect yourselves, but you've forgotten your protector. You're doing everything you can to get your act together, but you've forgotten the one who wrote the play. And so these people are completely missing the boat in terms of their relationship with God. And so in verse 13, he writes, instead of this remorse that we should find, this repentance, this is what I find. Joy and gladness, slaying oxen and killing sheep, eating meat and drinking wine. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. That's God's people saying, look, we're surrounded, we lost, we're going to die, so we might as well have a great party, we might as well go out with a bang, right? That sounds like the culture we live in, doesn't it? What would you do if you found out you had six months to live? This is like the web quiz that is so popular, right? What are you going to do if you found out you have a week to live or six months to live? And what are all the answers related to? Just like the people in Isaiah's day, right? Let's have a big party. I'm going to have the biggest party I can and waste as much money as I can to make sure that I get the celebration that I wanted. And according to Isaiah and to Paul, that's missing out on the whole scheme, the whole plan that God has for us. And you know what? This isn't something that's unique to Paul's day or Isaiah's day. There's a consistent theme throughout Scripture of people wondering about the reality of God, wondering if God's plan is really going to prevail in the end. In Job 35.3, it says, For you say, What advantage will it be to you? What profit shall I have more than if I had sinned? And you see the question that's being asked. Why am I living any differently than everyone else? How is my life any better than the people who are doing whatever it is that they want to do? That's in Job. That question is being asked. And in Malachi 3.14, You have said, It is useless to serve God. What profit is it that we have kept His ordinance and that we have walked as mourners before the Lord of hosts. What am I getting out of this deal? How is my life different? All these people focused on what they can see in the temporal world in which we live, and they're missing out on God's bigger plan. And so all these things point to the same thing, an avoidance of risk, a maintenance of comfort, right? I want me to be comfortable. I want me and my people to be safe. And if God's threatening that, well, maybe God's not as important as I thought he was. Because really what matters to me is my comfort and my safety. So these are the things that I'm going to be fully invested in. And so the question that that leads to is, why risk this life if there is no afterlife? Why would I risk this life if there is no afterlife? And so now we see two really scary, dangerous things that can result from this minor course adjustment of a few guys teaching that Jesus didn't really rise from the dead. There really is no resurrection. There's two big things. One is, I'm not going to invest in the afterlife if I don't believe there is one. Why would I? Secondly, I'm not going to take risk in this life if I don't believe there's an afterlife. But the kingdom calls us to both of those things. God calls us to both investing in the life to come and taking risk in this life for his glory. And we've just disabled ourselves if we disconnect from the truth that there is a resurrection, that Jesus did rise from the dead, that I can look forward to the day when I'm going to live forever with him. And here we return to what Paul really did, right? So he's asking these questions, but remember the life that he lived. This is 2 Corinthians 11, 23 through 27. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. 
From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Was this a man who was focused on comfort and safety? No. And he's making it really, really clear to us this morning why. Because he firmly believed that Jesus had risen from the dead, and he firmly believed that this life was temporary and was leading to an eternal one. So none of these risks mattered in comparison with what he had to look forward to. All of the investments he made in the kingdom, he had firm assurance that they would pay their dividends because he trusted the man who made the promise. He trusted the God who held the plan in his hands. So why risk this life if there is no afterlife? And I want to read you just a couple really short stories. This is from a book that I've recommended many times. It's called Don't Waste Your Life by John Piper. And he, he tells the stories of two different retirements that they're true stories, they both really happened, uh, that kind of illustrate the principle of risk taking, right? And so the first that I'm going to share with you is kind of the American traditional retirement, okay? This is a story from the February 1998 edition of Reader's Digest. A couple took early retirement from their jobs in the Northeast when he was 59 and she was 51. They live in Punta Gorda, Florida, where they cruise on their 30-foot trawler, play softball, and collect shells. Okay, does that sound like a normal retirement? Pretty much, right? Nothing out of the ordinary. It sounds like they're concerned with safety and comfort though, right? They're doing what they like to do and their investments are in the things that they enjoy. But there's another story from April of 2000. Ruby Eliason and Laura Edwards were killed in Cameroon, West Africa. Ruby was over 80. She had been single all her life. She poured it out for one great cause, to make Jesus Christ known among the unreached, the poor, and the sick. She was a widow, a medical doctor, pushing 80 and serving at her friend's side in Cameroon. The brakes failed and the car went over a cliff and they were both killed instantly. The guy who wrote this book used that as an illustration in his church service. And after he read their story, he said, is this a tragedy? Is it a tragedy that these two really, really old ladies who had invested their lives in the kingdom risked their lives driving on this road that they maybe shouldn't have been driving on and died? Or is it a tragedy that these other two people are wasting all this wealth and influence and power and money to satisfy themselves cruising around on their boat? Which is the tragedy? And he comes down on the, the traditional retirement as the tragedy. Because both sets of people had one life each. Each person was giving one life, and the life they were given was to be invested in God's kingdom. And the two older ladies chose to take risk with that life and to invest it in God's kingdom with all they had even to the point when they lost their lives. The others invested their lives in their comfort and their safety and their protection. And that's the kind of life we'll live if we're sitting under teaching that Jesus didn't really rise from the dead. If we're allowing ourselves to believe that Jesus didn't really rise from the dead, the most important thing to us is going to be our comfort and our safety and our security, not serving others for the glory of Jesus Christ. So this minor course correction makes a huge difference. He warns us more about that in the coming verses 33 and 34. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. So this is a verse that's taken out of context all the time. Who's heard those words? Evil company corrupts good habits. Or something like I have, right? Not from church, like in school I've heard it and read it, right? But the point that he's making in context is clearly if you sit around people who don't believe Jesus rose from the dead, you're going to make stupid decisions because you're going to make decisions that reflect your version of reality. And this is where the midweek Bible study fits in. A couple weeks ago, we were talking about the, the very early parts of this chapter and about the difference between the reality of Christ not rising from the dead and people teaching that Christ hasn't risen from the dead. 
And the observation that we made at that time in our small discussion was, for the people who are sitting under that teaching, there's no difference. Right? There's a guy on Mythbusters named Adam. Do you remember him? He often wore a t-shirt that said, I reject your version of reality and substitute my own or something like that. That's what people do. Right? He's just honest enough to put it on a t-shirt. All of us, even though there's only one real reality, have our own little versions. And we operate as if our version of reality were true and real and the only one. And so if you're living in a version of reality where Jesus Christ did not rise from the dead, you're going to make bad decisions. Because in the real reality, Jesus did rise from the dead. That's the point that Paul is making here. And so he says, don't be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Your Christian character will be subject to loss if you sit under false teaching that Jesus didn't rise from the dead. If you allow yourself to believe that you're not going to rise one day and live eternally with him, you'll make stupid investments with the one life that you have here on earth. Verse 34, he says, Awake to righteousness and do not sin. For some do not have the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. And from that, he leads to the third question that results when we don't believe that Christ rose from the dead. Someone will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? So we get to the heart of the matter. right? We had all the kind of philosophical excuses at the beginning, and here's the real issue. I've never seen someone rise from the dead. When I've met people who were dead, they stayed dead. That's been my experience. That's been the experience of everyone I know. And so... The people here are, I think, asking the honest question. Tell me how this happens. How do dead people come to life again? And with what body are they going to have? Because they knew then, in this time in history, there was a practice of using bone boxes, right? So the, the people would be put in a tomb until they had decayed to the point that they were a skeleton. The skeleton would be gathered and put in a little box, okay? And so they understood that the body the person had lived in wasn't going to just wake up and walk around. There needed to be something big and changing and an investment of power that was somehow supernatural for these bones to come alive and live again in a fresh new body. And so they were skeptical and they asked the question, and this is the same question we ask. Again, I changed the wording a little to, I think, match our culture, which is, why believe in a process I can't understand? Why believe in a process I can't understand? Who can explain to me how dead things come to life? Nobody. I don't understand how dead things come to life. And so I understand that people are skeptical. I understand when my coworkers talk to me about the things of this book that they have a hard time agreeing with me. They have a hard time recognizing this is truth because there's so much that we don't understand as human beings who have struggled with death, who've seen people we love die. So why would I believe in a process I can't understand? And then Paul goes into making it easier for us to understand. Look at verse 36. Foolish one, what you sow is not made alive until it dies. And the word sow there is for planting. For those of you who are picturing someone at a sewing machine, we're talking about planting stuff in the ground. And he's saying, look, you can't put alive apple trees in the ground and bury them and cover them up and hope that you'll get an apple eventually. It's kind of the reverse. You take the fruit off the tree, the seed, which looks totally dead it looks like a little chunk of stick and you put that in the ground and some amazing thing happens and you have a whole new apple tree and that whole new apple tree bears fruit can you explain that to me not very well right i can watch little biology videos on youtube but i can't really communicate to you with clarity and deep understanding how a seed that looks dead turns into a big alive apple tree or in our family we like tulips a lot right so we go get tulip bulbs wherever we get them, usually from Sabrina's dad. And in the fall, you put these dead husks of things in the dirt, and they stay there all winter. And they're just dead, rotting in the ground, as far as anybody knows, until the spring. And these amazing, beautiful flowers come to life. I can't really explain that to you. That's like magic. But it happens because God designed for it to happen that way. And so Paul takes this common thing that everyone has seen and uses that as a picture to help them understand this thing they're not understanding about the resurrection of the dead. You all understand that you put things that look dead in the ground, and then something amazing and alive comes out of it. We can all grasp that picture. And what you sow, you do not sow that body that shall be, but mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he pleases, and to each seed its own body. Verse 39. 
All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of animals, another of fish, and another of birds. Do we all understand that? My body is different from the body of a fish, and the body of a fish is different from the body of a bird. We can see it from creation, right? There's all this evidence in creation that God can build whatever kind of body he wants whenever he wants to build it. And we talked about this this morning in the adult Sunday school class, which I'd love for you all to attend if you could. In the beginning, when God decided that there should be animals, what did he do? Did he call up Lego and like get little bricks to shape the animals he wanted? No. He said, let there be light, and there was light. He said, let there be land, and there was land. He said, let there be every creeping thing, and there was every creeping thing. God's voice created life and a place for the life to thrive. God's voice created the kind of bodies that he wanted to appear on his planet. Verse 40, there are also celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies, but the glory of the celestial one is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differs from another star in glory. We know that, right? There's a scale that you can use, a numeric scale, to assign values of brilliance to stars. Humans who have nothing to do with the Bible have recognized the truth of what Paul's saying. There's all different qualities of light sources in the universe. There's all different levels of splendor when we look up at the night sky. Why? Because God wanted there to be. He created all different things at different levels of splendor, at different levels of glory, because creation makes it clear that God can fashion anybody at any time. Creation makes it clear that God can fashion anybody at any time. Verse 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. And this corruption is the sort of process of decay that I'm experiencing now and we all experience in our lives. Our bodies are not getting better as we age. Right? That's been my experience. Things that used to work well work less well. Right? Eyes that used to see clearly see less clearly. A heart that used to beat no matter what I was doing and pump blood everywhere it needed to go now sometimes make me short of breath if I run too long. All of us experience these things. Our bodies are sown in corruption. They're tending towards death. But they will be raised in incorruption. That means the body that is raised will not be trending toward death. It won't be aging and getting worse. That's an amazing truth that we can look forward to. Okay? It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. How are these bodies dishonored? They bear the stain of sin. Our bodies bear the mark of sin. We will fully bear the image of our Creator in a way that sin has marred right now, in a way that sin is staining, in a way that sin is breaking. One day that sin stain will be gone. And so it will be raised in glory. We will be in the glorious image of our Creator. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. I hope I don't need to tell you that your body is weak, right? When the people in the airplane crashed into the mountainside, they all died because their bodies couldn't handle the force they were subjected to, right? We all experience our weakness when we try to pick up something that's too heavy for us, right? Our bodies have limitations that our resurrection bodies will not have. They won't be subject to the same threats, right? We won't be worried about the flu virus for that season and whether I got the right vaccination because my body's not going to care about the flu virus. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. All of that goes together to say that the body that is coming makes the things that scare this one ridiculous. Right? This body that I live in, I'm scared of stuff. Right? I mentioned the bats in the cave. I don't want a bat with rabies to bite me and give me rabies because what will happen? I'll die. That doesn't sound enjoyable to me. I don't want to be in a vehicle crash because I know my body can't handle that. There are all kinds of things that I don't subject myself to because I don't want this body to die. But in my new body, that's not going to be a concern because all these things that are such a big threat to my body now will no longer be a threat because death 
will have no power over the new body. The body that he's coming makes the things that scare this one ridiculous. And then he concludes in verses 45 through 49. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterward the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of the dust, so also are those who are made of the dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. This whole thing points to a plan that God has. A plan that can't be changed, can't be altered, can't be destroyed by any of the forces in the universe. And we see that in Romans 8, 36 through 39. As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. All this stuff that we're afraid of has no power compared to the love of Jesus Christ. The love of Jesus Christ that has already demonstrated victory over death when he rose from the grave. Who disputes that I'm alive right now? Look at this body that's moving around. Anyone doubt that I'm alive? If so, we need to talk after service. Our <laughs> concerns. I'm alive, and you're alive. How did we get that way? How did I get this body to live in? God spoke it into existence, and we just read what his plan was for this body. This is a temporary body that I'm going to live in, and during the time he's given me in this body, I have an opportunity to establish a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And if I do that, he's going to give me another one, a better one, that can't die. So if you don't doubt that I'm alive in this body, which came from God, you have no reason to doubt that I'm going to live in my next body, which is also going to come from God, the resurrected body. And if you have questions about what that body is going to be like, we have a great example. Read the Gospels that share an account of Christ's life on earth post-resurrection. That's the kind of body we get. And so we can look at what he did. And if you wonder... What am I going to be like? What's life going to be like? We can read from our big brother what it's going to be like. And so I want to encourage you to do that. Read in the Gospels what these new bodies are going to be like. Because as surely as we have lived in these bodies, God's kids will live in resurrected ones. As surely as we have lived in these bodies, God's kids will live in resurrected ones. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this amazing good news as we wrestle with the challenges associated with the bodies we live in now. Help us to look forward to the, the day when we live in a resurrected body, a body that isn't worried about viruses and bacteria and car crashes and plane crashes because death has been defeated by the work of Jesus Christ. We thank you that we can live in this truth, and God, please give us the strength to trust it. Help us to obey you so that we don't end up even a little bit off course believing things about you or about ourselves that are not true. And as a result, missing out on the opportunity to be fully invested in your kingdom in the time that you give us here on the earth. We want to live for you. We want this time that you've given us to matter for eternity. So work in our hearts so that that becomes something that's possible for each of us to experience. We ask these things in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to learn more about us, check out our website at www dot silverlakebaptist dot o r g